It's being recorded. We're doing this in cooperation with the Conservation and Community Program with Downers Grove. And um, I'm going to go turn it over to Jim. And that's it. And I'm going to let Jim take it over from here. All right. Thank you, Jan. Can you see um, my screen and everything look good? Looks good. Well, I work for the Conservation Foundation. We're a not-for-profit land trust, and we do all types of conservation things uh, across the area. So we are in schools teaching kids about conservation practices. We're testing the water quality and, and trying to fix things in the all the waterways across DuPage. We're working with communities, park districts, uh, you name it, all the way down to individual homeowners. Our main office is in Naperville at the McDonald Farm. Even though the farm dates back to the 1870s, we've updated it with what they call green infrastructure. So these eco-friendly things we've added to the farm. So we've the farm is permanently protected. You can see where there would have been a road going right through the farm had it not been for the protection. And it would have just been another sea of houses. 49 of the 60 acres are organic food production. We've added solar panels, wind turbines, two different types of rainwater collection, a green roof, all the native plants that you are going to see tonight, we have at the farm and you can come and visit them. We certainly <coughs> would invite you to come and even as a group, um, we're going to do it for Glen Ellen and we could have a Downers Grove night and everybody from Downers Grove would come and get a tour. So we can set up things like that. If you're interested in it, um, you know, we'll, we'll send out some links at the end. Why I'm doing this is 95% of the property in Illinois is private property. So if we're thinking that we want to make Downers Grove better, green, we have to think about private property being connected. So that's why we work with businesses and park districts and the municipality as a whole and try to implement things and then get all the way down to the landowner. A lot of the people that I talk to, they say, well, I want to do something better, but I don't know where to start. And that's where we come in. In this book by Stephen Kellert, he states that we won't be truly healthy, happy, or satisfied if we live apart from the environment in which we evolve. So here I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail, guiding my son to his first big muskie. Where do we go? We go on vacation. We, we fly away and we go to nature. I went to Yellowstone and just got back from swimming in the Gulf of Mexico. And if you think about it, we love nature. And if I asked you about your favorite things that have happened in your life, you would tell me about you used to go to your grandpa's farm or um, other positive natural things that you've been able to do. And it isn't odd that we're drawn to nature because we are animals. And I teach at COD and um, do these lectures because people just have forgotten that we are connected to the earth in many different ways. So I'm working with the Conservation at Home program. We now have eight different organizations doing, helping people across Northeastern Illinois, parts of Wisconsin, parts of Michigan, and all the way down to almost St. Louis. And the idea is connecting people and giving them education and helping them change things for the better. This represents a map of the Chicagoland area and every little dot is a home that's been certified. Downers Grove is the leading community for having yards certified and you have wonderful groups like Downers Pierce Downers uh, group and um, the organic vegetable gardeners that promote native plantings and we've done things all across the area with non-residential properties too churches um, right in Downers Grove we've done good Sam a lot of different places that we work with very closely including the village and the park districts. So some of the things that we're trying to do, there's a win-win situation. I try to bring that to people that when I'm asking you to plant some milkweed for the monarchs, it can actually bring productivity to your garden. So here this bee balm is drawing, it's like a magnet for pollinators and they're gonna be right here when this pear tree needs to be pollinated. And here this swamp milkweed is going to attract the pollinators to pollinate the veggies that they have in the um, 
in the food forest. So you can see how pretty flowers are going to actually make your tomatoes better and your peppers. When you think about all the things you have in your garden from zucchini and um, cucumbers, all of those things need pollinating. And the plants I'm talking about will bring that along with pretty um, aesthetics too. So we do things with the park district right on this site. I'm standing on a bridge and a mink swam across the garden right here. So these areas of the, of the parks that are not conducive to ball fields, many of us are older than, our kids are older than ball field kids age. And so we're walking dogs or we're pushing grandchildren and we need to be able to enjoy the natural areas in the parks too. And it, working with parks has been very satisfying to, they own large tracts of land and having them naturalize it is a really wonderful thing. This is from the Naperville Park District where there was a, there was a mud hole that was too steep to, to mow. And so that ditch was now created, um, turned into a bioswale. So we're not gonna call it a ditch anymore, but there's a place for the rabbits to go hide when the mower comes or a snake or a praying mantis or the butterflies can come to an area that is not conducive to bike riding or ball fields. Why, why are we trying to mow everywhere? And it's pretty simple things I try to bring to people that we're gonna work on water conservation, looking at how the drainage is on your property and attracting birds and butterflies, less chemical use, less grass here and there, healthy soil and more diverse and healthy trees. Where it all starts is that this is a plant-based planet. There is no life on this planet without plants. So understanding that they're not just a decorative thing we put around, they are life. There is no air, all the water, the atmosphere, everything was created by plants. And they're the only thing on the planet that can turn through the use of photosynthesis sunlight into food. And so the whole food chain drives on plants. So once we understand that plants are essential for life, then the next step is that what type of plants we put in our yards is extremely important. If you want this hummingbird to come, <clears throat> then you have to put something there for the hummingbird. They don't come for conversation. They don't come for a cup of coffee and they scan your yard. They're here. They're on their way here now. I haven't seen one yet, but they're going to scan your yard for something that they can eat. And if you don't see them, it's because we haven't put anything there for them. So right now, the, the penstemon is getting bigger. It's going to bloom just about the time they arrive. And that's one of the first things they feed on. So if we want to track these things, just like a, a recipe, if you want to make chocolate cake, you just don't start throwing things in a bowl. You have to look and see what I need to put in there. And the same type of thing happens with our landscape. We just don't think of it that way. If you want the hummingbirds, let's put something there for them. And here's where it comes down to is evolution. So this is the prairie state, and this is turf grass over here on the left. So these plants have evolved with differences. They've understood or come to uh, evolve with these deep root systems. They go deeper than an oak tree. And even though you don't see all this, it's there. And that's what makes them sustainable and long lasting. So I'm gonna show you pictures where in the middle of a terrible drought we had, these plants are blooming from the water they stored from April, May. We have rain every April, May. We have a drought every July or August. And these plants understand that. We can burn the plants. Buffalo used to trample across them. The top of the part, this top part up here is sort of sacrificial. If it gets destroyed or damaged, it's not gonna kill the plant because they put their important parts below ground. We understand evolution in the animal world, like a cheetah can run fast to catch the gazelle, or a giraffe has this long neck to eat acacia leaves, or a turtle carries its shell around, but we don't see evolution in plants and we don't appreciate it. But if you see how those plants actually look underground, then it kind of gives you a different idea of how massive these 
root systems can be. And the root systems are what actually created soil. When you think about it, the glacier didn't bring beautiful, rich topsoil here. It was created in these root systems. So it's made a lot of function in our yards. And a lot of times now we're living in subdivisions with they've scraped off the topsoil. We have compacted clay, poor soil, and it doesn't matter at all to these native plants. So there's some tricks. How do you make native look nice? And this is what I teach at COD, that you plump plants. So our eyes are looking for structure and that shorter is usually better than tall. Spacing between the plants looks, makes it look like it's organized. We can decorate with logs and rocks and bird baths. And maybe we don't have as many species as we would in a prairie in, in a garden area. You facilitate movement by putting paths or rocks and areas where you can move in and out. And we put plants in there that are kind of foolproof. So people tell me they have a brown thumb, they can't grow anything. Well, let me get you these native plants that have evolved here and I think it'll be different. So look at the pretty the flowers. You're looking at cardinal flower. This is Joe Pieweed, uh, prairie drop seed and that is um, the pink one there, it skips my mind. Um, so how do we do that when we want this front yard beautiful? Oh, well, that's what it is, prairie smoke, that's what that is. Okay, so in the front yard, we wanna have these examples of things. Here's a milkweed that I had tucked away in, in my house, but having it organized, and it, notice there isn't 20 different species here, but we can integrate some of these things in a very attractive way. In a backyard situation, by having a path, you see the rocks and the bird bath and the fencing over here. It looks like a typical backyard size, but it's not the typical backyard of turf. But if you were sitting on your patio, you're much more likely to see an indigo bunting or tanager or, or these other native birds that'll come when you have created habitat for them. When we did the development across the area, if you looked at an area like this that was farms, it was 99% um, permeable. And each time we change it, it goes down. This is 60% um, is now running off. And downtown Chicago, 99% runoff. And the water reflects that Runoff is the same thing as um, it will carry pollution. There's erosion, there's flooding, a bunch of problems with it. So we've done that to our areas. The water in the river is running brown and polluted. We've got problems in all of our rivers. And how do we reverse that is by changing the landscape to again, be permeable. When I first came to see Carol and Doug, their woods here were choked with honeysuckle and buckthorn. And when I showed them what those trees were, they were saying, Jim, we're gonna have to cut down like 90% of the trees. And I said, that's what needs to be done, that this was a savanna. And it was about a year later they called and they said, we got it cut. And I said, seriously? So I came back and this is the picture I took that day. They earned their conservation at home sign and she was telling me he was out there till nine o'clock at night with a headlight cutting buckthorn. And I said, well, now the next thing you need is a bluebird house. And she said, Jim, we've been here for years and we've never seen a bluebird. And I said, well, you never had a savanna. And no more than I said that, in comes this bluebird and lands on her fence. So she now has nesting bluebirds on the property and the wildflowers have started to restore themselves. If the seed bank lasts for decades. So once the sun came back, the trillium, the bloodroot, the Solomon seal, I can see in these um, small areas that they're coming back in the in the woodland. And what we want is not what we have. So 50% of the recent bird count, this is this one is English sparrow and the starling, English starling, both invasive species in Illinois. Grackles are just over um, populated 
and geese I'll talk about a little bit later, but these four were 50% of the bird count. What you really want in your yard are these. Now this group will come to a feeder once in a while for a snack, but we have to understand that the snack is not a permanent food source for them. So even this hummingbird, we put out the sugar water, in a Pepsi, it isn't going to sustain me. And what they sustain themselves are on is through eating bugs. So understanding that the plants bring the bugs, the bugs bring the birds. And this is the way that we can um, create habitats that are going to be sustainable and attractive to groupings of birds like this. The next group, this will, these will never come to your bird feeder. Even this little wren that we love, he never comes to a bird feeder. And we, love, we want him to come, he sings really pretty. We put out a birdhouse for him and we have no clue what he's eating. What he eats is ants. And the meadowlark, all of these birds primarily eat bugs. Some of the birds will switch this group in here, right in the center and the oriole will switch to berries in the in the summer. So if you have serviceberry, viburnums, chokeberry, the native shrubs, you can certainly think that you're gonna attract these berry eating birds. And the other part of nature, everybody loves the butterflies, but that's only part of the ecosystem. And we wanna have a healthy intact ecosystem. So, I'm out there, we're producing or creating butterfly gardens, but they are really going to help all of nature. So the bees come along, the other pollinators, you create habitat for rabbits and other things at the same time. So we're kind of using the monarch as the poster child. We're gonna build habitat for it and the rest is gonna come along under the radar. This is Blazing Star. There are several different varieties. You can use it in a wet spot. There's one for a dry area. There's one for a little bit of shade. And it's very attractive to monarchs and other butterflies and pollinators. And unlike the butterfly bush that you might have, which are not native here, and they die. So a butterfly bush only lasts maybe two or three years in this climate. And we can plant this Leatris that comes back year after year and can feed the butterflies and be just as attractive to them. Downtown Lyle, we put in a rain garden. So there, this area used to wash the water down and we created this little rain garden. And right next to the train station, the police station, city hall, we planted this and the monarchs found it, even in a very densely urban area. This is swamp milkweed. It has very thin, fine leaves and a beautiful pink flower. It will have pieces golden Alexander, things that grow wet plants that we can put in these rain gardens. And it's a win-win situation. Solve the landscaping problem and created habitat at the same time. I want, went to one home and they had um, an area in the back that flooded. So they said, Jim, come on around the back and take a look at this flooded area. Well, when I got back there, I took this picture and it certainly wasn't flooded at this time. And you're, you're looking at compacted clay. So it's very difficult to grow in that kind of a condition where it's gonna be underwater some parts of the year and then bone dry and hard packed clay other times of the year. But plants like this swamp milkweed are very adaptable to being wet and dry and we're going to encourage them to use organic material like compost and work it into the soil and improve this soil over a period of time until it is rich and more absorbent. Some of the other plants that love to be in those wet areas, cardinal flower the, and the blue lobelia, wet shade is, is a great thing for the cardinal flower. The blue lobelia will grow in the sun and part shade. Carex sedges are a really nice thing. They're grass-like, but there, is, there are varieties that can grow in the deep shade, in full sun, in wet areas, you name it. This picture is taken at the Morton Arboretum 
where they had a, a section here where it is just a sedge garden. They don't have to mow it. So I'm gonna train your eye to look at poor landscape. This was one in Naperville where they called us and they said that this used to be a vegetable garden and no one wanted to stay after work at the city hall and tend the vegetables. So it just went to disarray and we changed it um, to a butterfly garden. We increased the walkway through it so you can get in there and smell it and see the bugs and the birds. And it's a now a beautiful garden that comes back year after year with minimal uh, weeding. But you can see how we've improved the landscape and made habitat right in downtown Naperville. So what would you do in a residential home? These people called and they said that they've got a number of problems, no birds, no butterflies. The water from the front yard drains down on the sidewalk and causes problems. In the summer, they have wet feet. And in the wintertime, it's ice and they have to put salt down for the ice and the salt kills the grass. And what would you do? Well, we started by removing the big arborvita that hid all the beautiful brickwork. We lowered an area to the side over here where the water no longer pours down on the sidewalk. It goes to the lowest spot, which is over here. We planted native plantings, created a defined edge for the grass, less grass, and installed clumpings of plants. It will improve over time. This is a relatively new planting that you're seeing right now. So we can make it look better, better curb appeal, attract um, birds and butterflies and absorb the water. In a backyard situation, we're assuming that they've sprayed this with Roundup or some type of 2,4-D weed killer. And the water always has been engineered to drain away from the house. So we're gonna minimize that disruption of, of or pollution of the water by creating a buffer on the outside. Here you're looking at cone flowers. This is obedient plant. This is the native sunflower, cone flowers over here, big blue stem. And the water that comes off the house is absorbed in the outside part here. These plants then can filter all the chemicals that are in carried by the water. And you've got a pretty backdrop to the house at the same time. All it takes for you to think about if your yard is functioning or whether it's um, decorative is to Google where your plant comes from. And even things like roses or lilacs that are nice, I'm not saying that these are not nice, but these are not functioning. You're not going to see um, bees and butterflies on these plants that are from foreign places. And notice the turf grass here that came from Europe and it has zero environmental value in our yards. So just understanding that some of your plants are functional and they're doing things, they're absorbing water, they're filtering water, they're feeding wildlife, and some plants are just purely decorative. Now, if, if you love them anyway, just understanding that they're decorative and that's okay. But I don't think people have segmented their thought pattern to think that what's decorative and what's functional. Inside of our homes, we would definitely want the functional things. We want the microwave, the stove, the refrigerator, the couch, the bed. We have to have function. Then we can decorate with a pretty little rug over here or some plastic flowers or other things in your home. But we step outside and we don't think about function versus decorative. Look at the pretty flowers that are all gonna be functional in our area. If it's heavy shade, these bluebells, wet areas that I showed you this cardinal flower, turtle head, blue flag iris, the milkweed, coreopsis, blazing star, be beautiful plants that can be utilized in our gardens. So it's not trading function for attraction. And isn't this a beautiful picture? You don't wanna put a picnic blanket down here and have a, a outing with your family. You know it's going to be loaded with goose poop. You know it's been treated. There's no dandelions. And erosion of the shoreline. And is this really what you want? 
we're paying a tremendous amount of money to maintain these spaces. We've attracted geese. Geese like turf because they can see their number one priority is keeping safe. And that would be from fox or coyote or dogs. And they want a visual um, space. It takes them a long time to get up and fly. So they need time and they can get that by being able to see the predators a long way away. So besides the erosion of the shorelines, we can change a lot of different things by changing the landscape. So here there are no geese. The geese will not walk through the prairie. We're gonna have a heron, frogs, crayfish, all the different bugs and butterflies using these native plantings. The erosion of the shoreline is gone. When the rain comes down, it, it hits multiple different things and breaks up the power of it hitting the ground that it doesn't do when there's turf. So, you know, will these homeowners complain if the HOA or a park district change this from the traditional? That's what I'm trying to change people's attitudes. I took this picture, picture in Oswego where they were mowing this day and there was no need to mow. The grass had not grown at all, but they had a, probably had a contract to mow every week and somebody was fulfilling the contract. Um, it was ridiculous, uh, not even good for the grass. You could see the dirt being blown up in the air, um, but we love our grass and we're doing the wrong things with it. I used to sell fertilizer. This first number in a bag of fertilizer, this is a bag of Scott's fertilizer. This is nitrogen and phosphorus and potash. Heavy nitrogen is not good for your lawn. It makes the blade grow really quick. And you'd say like, wow, look at how fast the grass grew. Well, that's not what you want. You want healthy and healthy would be a more balanced fertilizer. And we try to grow grass where it's in the shade. We're doing all the wrong things and it's causing problems in the waterways. We're covering the United States with grass. So the green states here are the states that are dominated with grass. Most of the states that are not dominated with grass are either mountainous, uh, sparsely populated with people, or they have um, different crops in Kansas. The temperature is different and it's not conducive to grass. Otherwise, I think it'd be grass there too. Look at the money. $40 billion on grass care, 20 million acres of an unproductive crop. It doesn't bring broccoli. It's not feeding the poor. It's biologically dead. And yet we have to water it and try to take care of it. We're mowing it every week. It, it just doesn't make sense. And if I showed you some other pictures, here's the one where, look at the drought, uh, what grass looks like in a drought. And the native stuff, this orange is milkweed. It's the swamp milk, or, uh, butterfly milkweed. And if you were walking down here, would you be looking to the left or the right? Where would you see the butterflies? Where would you find a, a baby rabbit? Um, and does it make sense that we've chosen this to be the covering across the United States? The shade areas, a lot of people talk to me and right now the wild geranium are blooming. Let me go back to that one. There's woodland flocks, um, some of the sedges, Back here, the yellow is celandine poppy. Beautiful things that grow very well in the shade and we don't have to have grass around our trees. We created some uh, conceptual things that you can do instead of grass on large areas. It's a pollinator meadow and we have it at the farm. If you come and see it, we have 25 feet wide and it's 1400 lineal feet that we've converted from turf to a meadow. We sold the concept to the tollway authority. So this front part is called the front slope and this is the back slope. And I don't want the front part because it's full of broken car parts and salt, but the back slope, they used to have water in this ditch, no more with all these native plantings. The white is the penstemon that the hummingbirds are gonna eat from. Um, the water doesn't sit in the ditch anymore. And it's 50% less costly for the toll road to maintain than the turf. So we're saving money, which means saving tolls for us. So how would we do this? Implement the same type of things 
in our yards. In this depiction, we're taking water coming off the roof. We're watching where it comes. It pours down the yard and ends up pouring out in the street. So we're going to intercept that with garden plants that are going to absorb that water. We could do it up here, right by this downspout. We could put a little rain garden right there. But in this depiction, it comes out here. And then there was an actual one that was just the same. So the water used to come from the house down and come across this sidewalk here. We lowered it down and we put a little French drain here for overflow. And the flowering plants in here now absorb the water and it doesn't come up on the sidewalk anymore. We've been paving everything across our communities and it's causing runoff. So now the number one source of pollution in our waterways is from what they call non-point source pollution. It's not coming from a pipe from a factory. It's coming from the runoff on the ground. And you can see how water is going to run down into our creeks and rivers. In Downers Grove, a lot of the homes have ditches in the front of the yards up by the road and those feed into the creek. The creek feeds into the river and that water just washes down the stream. After a quarter to a half inch of rain, the water can no longer absorb into the grass and then it goes horizontally. So it doesn't go down into the ground anymore. The grass is like a tarp and it starts rolling it sideways, carrying all the material from the grass into our waterways. When all of that rich nutrient load from leaves and our grass washes into the water, it's called a eutrophication state where the water is highly nutrified and it causes algae growth. So the water turns green or brown and that plant growth in the water depletes the oxygen for the fish and a lot of the other the crayfish and the fish feed the birds. You can see how that whole system go, breaks down with polluted water. A lot of the, um, you wouldn't think of nutrients as being pollutants, but when they get too high, they actually do degrade the quality of the water. And one of the ways to fix it would be with plants. So phytoremediation is the term to use plants to clean soil, water, and air. So these plants will pull the nitrogen out of the water, making the water more clean, more clear, and better for fish. So in this depiction, the road is high, the water's been engineered to drain down to this drain head, and we're gonna plant it with plants that are gonna absorb that water before it gets in the drain. This doesn't look so bad. If you had a drain in your yard like this, you'd say, well, I don't live anywhere near the river, so I'm not having an impact, but all of those drain heads are connected. And when you see the other side of the pipe, which is sometimes miles away from your home, it's not a pretty picture that's happening in our creeks and rivers. Here, my boss and I are creating a rain garden. So we've got a downspout here and there's one over here. Notice the air conditioner sitting up here. We've created a basin that we want the water to drain down into. We put a rubber mat so it drains in this direction. These rocks behind me are gonna go over the rubber mat to slow that water down to a trickle. And then we're gonna plant this up with plants. So this is spiderwort. There's the penstemon again, prairie drop seed out here on the dry areas. This is even one that popped up, we didn't plant it. This is a native yucca, it's called rattlesnake master. And it found a dry area above the edge to take hold there. Notice we put viburnum shrubs to cover the air conditioner. We don't have to mow it. We have birds and butterflies, win-win situation. So between the rain barrels and rain gardens, those are the two ways that people can easily use water to capture and create habitat. The rainwater is actually better for your plants. I have a basil tree that's several years old that I keep alive by feeding it nothing but rainwater. Even in the winter, I bring in uh, snow and melt it in my back patio 
and then use rainwater on my indoor plants. We've sold over 14,000 rain barrels. We have a rain barrel and composter sale that's going on right now. And it'll be pick up in a couple of weeks in Oak Brook. So we have the barrels at the farm all the time that you can get them. You can order them through Downers Grove or pick them up through us. And these are food grade barrels. We've solved all the problems of mosquitoes and drainage. And we can help you with how you'd hook them up. It's one easy way to deal with some of the water issues. And if you thought they were ugly, you paint them. We've had contests, um, different communities have put them out on the street and had um, shown how pretty they could be if you wanted to decorate them. And that's what we're doing the conservation at home program is just helping you implement these things. If you wouldn't know where to start, we have brochures that talk about the plants. We have, we'll offer home visits for free. We have availability for the plants and we have a whole program to make it easier for you. So I'm gonna open up to questions. Here's my office number and my email and feel free to fire away with your questions. And I also wanted to bring up Jim, um, I'm gonna do a chat here that we have, um, the Downers Grove is having a plant sale that's going on right now online. This is the link I put in chat to, it's our, the Conservation Foundation uh, site that you can order trees and shrubs. The, and also there's a rain barrel sale um, pickup and the pickup date for the native trees and shrubs and the rain barrel is uh, Thursday, June 3rd from two to six. So you can order online now for your rain barrels and um, the uh, native trees and shrubs. So right now I have no questions for you, Jim. <laughs> Maybe you told them so much that they don't need any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can tell you that I've been walking properties uh, five to seven a day uh, recently, and a lot of them come up with the same issues all the time. They have some ground covers that have gone crazy, whether it be yellow archangel or vinca, pachysandra, English ivy, euonymus, something has gone crazy over, grown over everything. So, well, so I someone think Someone just put in the question, uh, how do you schedule a home visit? So just call or email, yes. You can just call or email Jim, his information's right there, and he can schedule it with you. Uh, yeah. Julie had a question. Email's a little easier. So we have some written documentation and we're not playing phone tag. Um, Julie has a question. Do you have any suggestions for native plants for shady areas instead of grass low profile? Yeah, um, my favorites, I'd start with um, wild geranium, woodland phlox, wild ginger are the, the top ones. Um, we, we recommend pulling the grass away from the trees. So if you have nice trees that you love, pull the grass away from them, give them some space and, and um, just put wood chips and these native plantings. So those are my top ones. There's a bunch of other ones that are really nice. I mean, depending if you're in a wooded area, a trillium, bloodroot, that celandine poppy that I had, most of the, the stuff in the shade is low profile. They're very little tall things um, just because it doesn't get enough light to, to make strong, vigorous plants. So they're a little bit shorter. The big color show for shade is in the spring. And then when the, tree blooms, or, you know, the leaves bud out, it's pretty deep shade and there's not enough um, power there for these plants to flower in the summer. So the prairie plants out in the sun bloom in the summer and the big spring color is when you get it in the shade. And also um, I would su suggest if you can't, so when, if you're looking for something else in the shade for in the summertime, do textures, you know, think about using ferns I have a different texture. So I look at other textures in shade area too that are attractive. Um, another great plant uh, for the shade, it gets about 18 inches is uh, the 
Solomon Seal was a great shade plant, a little bit taller. It's not, but not real tall. As Jim said, they don't get real tall. And if you're also, you're looking for suggestions for shade plants or any, uh, if you're just starting out doing garden design on our, uh, the Conservation Foundation YouTube site, Nancy Sonato and myself did a webinar on March 31st. It's Garden Refresh. And we are redoing all the gardens at the Conservation Foundation like from beginning to end. And we have one that is, uh, we did a plan and it has a shade area that's also dry. And in it, we go over all the plants that we put in that area and all the plants that Jim mentioned. The uh, wild ginger is one of my favorites too. Uh, and right now I have my wild, uh, wild geranium is blooming. It's a beautiful purple flower. So that is blooming right now. And a lot of the spring ephemerals, as he said, are coming up right now and they'll be dying back. If you go in the woods, you can probably see them right now. Um, someone asked, can you give more details about rain barrel hookup? Sure. There's two common hookups. One, you just cut the downspout and put an elbow on it and dump it in the top of the rain barrel. The rain barrels have screens on the top. That's a very simple application. I have that one on the back of my garage. If you have a basement or if you're worried about it overflowing, it's, you know, if you're in some critical area like that, then we sell diverters where it sends it to the rain barrel first. When the rain barrel's full, then it goes down the downspout like it typically would. So um, we do have a YouTube video on our website, and there are numbers of YouTube videos about rain barrel installation. But I would be happy to answer any of the questions too if you email me, or I can show you what our diverters look like, those kinds of things. And if you go to the Downers Grove Public Works, that's who we're working with through this program, they did a great video on rain barrels as far as their promotion. So it's sort of funny if you go, if you want to get more detail about the sale of the rain barrels themselves. And as Jim said, it's on our YouTube and it's actually, um, you can go to our website and find it there too, more information about hooking up. And we provide all of the uh, extra items you need to hook your rain barrel up. We have the stand that you can actually place your rain barrel on because it is a gravity flow, as he said, and you have to raise it up. And we have the diverters, we have all the, and everything you need to get your rain barrel all set up. Um, and you can order that through our website. So that's, those are our questions right now. Oh wait, there's one in the question and answer and not in the chat, let's see what this says. Yeah, and if you have any more questions, you can throw them in question and, uh, question and answers. It says, do you know anywhere that still has native plants for sale? The pre-sales are sold out everywhere. Well, part of our part of our program <clears throat> is helping people with those plants. So we have the conservation at home program, and we can put the link in there where you can um, Jan put that in the link if you would, or in the follow up email. But there's a link where you can join the conservation at home program, and it's fifty dollars. But even if you don't, just email me and say I've been looking for milkweed, or I'm looking for certain things and I would be happy to help you. The closest place that sells a big selection um, is the growing place in Naperville, or you go, you can go into Wanamaker's. I've tried to work with them. They have some native stuff. And if you went in there and, and said, this is what I want, do you have it? They could get it for you. Yeah, and I'll put in, in the chat, um, our, it's our website, if you go there, uh, it's the conservationfoundation.org. And uh, you can get some information. There are resources for native plants in there also. We have a whole list under resources, as Jim said that. And also um, Possibility Place has an online order of uh, native plants that you can go there also and order pl native plants online. That's another source. Oh, someone said, uh, Carrie thought there's Downers Grove Park District still has a native, uh, or still has a plant sale going on. So that's another, uh, the park district has one. And ours is just trees and shrubs uh, through the Downers Grove Public Works Department. So any other, if there's any more, let's see, I'll see if there's anything else that's in chat. So we answered that one. Let's see, yeah, the, the, there's been a, we found that in the area, it's, there has been like a shortage of trying to find native plants. And part of it is there's a high demand right now since everyone's been staying at home. Uh, it seems like there's been a higher demand on native plants, which is good. And um, my husband's in the landscape, uh, he's a landscape architect in the business too. And he heard that there's been a supply 
chain interruption of resin that produce, produces pots. And some nurseries can't get some of the pots they need to plant to pot their plants up. At least a nursery up north told my husband that some of the smaller ones, it's fine, but some of the bigger pots, he said they're having trouble getting. So some nurseries aren't able to supply uh, some of the, in, the material that we need right now. Well, if there's no more questions, um, I guess that's a wrap. And I want to thank you, Jim. And well, we will, we have recorded this, as I said, and we will uh, share the link with the Downers Grove Public Works. And we will put it up on our website. And we can also have Downers Grove Public Works make this available to their residents uh, if they have any questions. So with that. Did anybody else have, you know, there's, uh, if you're part of an HOA or a church or any other kind of uh, affiliation to property ownership, we can help with that. And if anybody wants to come out to the farm, we can also help with that. So just contact us one way or another. If you really want to do something and change, make change, we want to be here to help you. And the other thing we have too, I didn't mention, we had worked with the Downers Grove Public Works and they had a bioswale program for those of you that don't have uh, curbs and you have the, the, the flat roads that go right into what they are called uh, drainage uh, ditches um, or bioswales. We have a plant list of plants that we provided. We can provide also to you that has plants that grow well in really wet conditions along the hillsides that are a little bit drier um in in some areas and we have all the native plants that thrive in all those conditions and also uh, julie just said that downers grove offers a stormwater utility incentive program for rain gardens and rain barrels so uh, you can take advantage of that too uh, through downers grove the uh, public works department thank you julie yeah downers grove is the only community around that will give you rebates for installing a rain barrel or a rain garden so yeah. absolutely, yeah. if you haven't taken those exemptions, do that. Yeah, because when you pick up uh, through the rain barrel sale, when you come to pick up your rain barrel, uh, they will make sure you have the rebate form and you take a picture of your rain barrel showing it installed and you can get a rebate. And also the village will also pay for installation of bioswales. So if you do have those, what you call drainage ditches in your front yard, which are actually bioswales, um, you know, we're, we're happy to come out and help with those too and help you get started uh, making those native. Okay, well, thank you. thank you everyone. Have a good night and we'll be signing off.